Okay, this is part two of uh, the screencast on spectrophotometry. So first we covered basic properties of light, what gives molecules their color, how uh, we can use that to uh, determine, you know, their, how we might use that in a spectrophotometer, uh, and how spectrophotometers work, and now we're going to talk about the theory behind spectrophotometry so you can have some equation to relate the intensity of light to the concentration of your molecule of interest within a sample. So a lot of uh, what I talk about and the simulations that I'm going to talk about may be found on my website there. Let me get my pen All right down there. <coughs> so <coughs> as what, well, this is what you'll do most of the time in your career as an engineer or scientist. You'll start by defining the control volume. So we are going to define the volume as this poorly drawn cube, which looks much better there. Basically, we've got our cube. Into the cube comes intensity I naught. Out of the cube comes intensity I. We want to measure the intensities and be able to determine what is inside that cube. So. What might cause I to be different from I naught? We talked about that in the last uh, screencast. And we want to find a governing equation so that we can quantify what the concentration is inside of that cube. So let's first, by looking at it intuitively, what's going on on a molecular level? If we were able to shrink ourselves down and look at a tiny little piece <coughs> of liquid in there at you know some frozen time, we'd see light coming in intensity I and light going out, intensity I plus 1. In there, there'd be maybe a couple molecules I've just shown because we've shrunk down so much. So what light makes it through? So if we're looking at just this area A, if uh, by the light's perspective, it's basically, you know, the light can make it through any spot but where there is a molecule. These molecules have a certain chance to absorb and they have what we call an effective area. So this may not be the, the exact area of the molecule. It's, it's the, the area that is able to absorb. <clears throat> you know, even if uh, the light coming through is of the wavelength that is preferentially absorbed by the molecule, it may not get absorbed. So this effective area just is, is a reflection of some probability that the light in that area will be absorbed. And the rest of the area the light just passes through unaltered, but in this area it is basically shaded. So let's start by thinking what happens if we take increasingly thicker slices. So if we double the slice, 2 delta x, we end up with a couple more molecules. They end up shading even more of that area A. Do it again, go to 4 delta x, we end up with more molecules blocking. So of course the trend is that with increasing thickness, we end up with uh, more of the light blocked. What if instead of uh, changing thickness, we ins we change the concentration, so we add more molecules, basically. So if we double the molecules, <clears throat> we end up with, you know, double the area blocked. So intuitively, it's pretty clear, right? How do we formally come up with an equation that would let us quantify the concentration given a, a sample width and given our measurements of intensity I and I naught. <clears throat> first, how would we get I naught? So I, I naught comes in the cuvette, I goes out. We measure I with our sample in there, but if we want I, want I naught, we'd put a cuvette in there with a clear liquid like water. So <clears throat> let's start by asking what percentage of light is blocked in each slice of width delta x. So we know the number of molecules. Well, we do if we have concentration, we'll get to that. That's what we're after. So we want to back calculate that. Each molecule has some effective area A. So if we multiply n times A, divide that by the total area, that's the percentage of light blocked. 1 minus that is percentage of light, or 100% minus that is percentage of light transmitted. <clears throat> so those, those equations are there. So basically in each slice, a certain percent of light makes it through. So what would that look like 
graphically. So, you know, in the slice i plus 1, it's a function of the previous intensity times some factor tau. So if we start out with 100% light, multiply that, in this case we're just assuming tau is 90%. 90% 90 of 100 is 90, but in this next step we take 90% of 90, which is 81%, 90% of 81, 73, so on and on, and we asymptotically approach 0, we never quite get there though. So what if we plot this out? We end up with a plot that looks kind of like this. So you should recognize this as something that uh, you know has some sort of exponential decay. Should look like something like one over x to some positive power. So let's see if we can find that equation. So if we look at that area again, we start with you know knowing that that much of light is transmitted and that much is absorbed. We can come up with you know basically that equation that intensity at i plus one equals intensity at i times the percentage transmitted. Use a little algebra to rearrange because we want this in terms of the change in intensity because that is ultimately what we're going to have when we do our measurements. <coughs> so we know the change in intensity through a slice equals the intensity entering the slice times the number of molecules there, their effective area, and divided by the total area. But we want this in terms of the change in thickness and concentration, because we are after concentration and we can measure thickness. So this, there's the equation we start with. Let's first ask ourselves, what is n? What is the number of molecules inside this volume? <laughs> there. Uh, <coughs> N is, of course, related to concentration. Concentration is just, you know, number of molecules or moles or mass per volume. Let's assume the concentration is in terms of molarity, which is moles per volume. So in that case, we need to use Avogadro's number right here, which gives us the number of molecules per mole. So the number of molecules in that space equals Avogadro's number times the concentration, which is moles per volume, and then we need to multiply it by the volume of this cube. So what is that volume? That volume is basically defined our problem such that it's pretty easy. It's just that area times the thickness, delta x. So if we substitute in this equation and this equation into this equation, then we do a little algebra, we end up with the following. So the change in intensity equals the original intensity, negative original intensity, times uh, the uh, effective area of the molecule, times Avogadro's number, times the concentration, times the thickness, delta x. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, so what now, we've got our equation in terms of difference in intensity, difference in thickness. Now we need to do a little trick of calculus. I assume, no, I'm pretty sure you're all in calculus or you have taken calculus. So this should be familiar to you. We're just going to take the limit of that thickness, delta x, as it goes to zero. So we're going to make these slices infinitesimally small, and that causes us to get an infinitesimal difference in the intensity and in the thickness. So <clears throat> now we're getting close to the point where we can uh, get a continuous equation. But before we do that, we need to separate our variables, which means we need to put the i's with the i's and keep the x's on the other side. So we do that, separate our variables, and what's next? We need to integrate. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to integrate over the total width of the sample, so from 0 to w. And as we go from 0 to w, the intensity of light goes from i naught to i. So we integrate that equation with these limits on our integration. <coughs> Thank you.
because that effective area, Avogadro's number, and the concentration should not change through that sample uh, with distance, we can pull those out of the integral, and we end up with a pretty simple equation. I hope you, well, all of you should certainly know how to do this one. You should probably remember how to do this one, but let's just cover it quickly. What is the integral of dx over x? And the integral of dx is just x, but the integral of dx over x is the ln of x. So natural log. So if we have x2 minus x1, it ends up being x2 over x1, the ln of that. And that one's pretty simple. It's just x2 minus x1. So if we use these equations in here, we end up with the following. Natural log of intensity over intensity naught, I naught, I, equals the width of the cuvette times basically a constant. And we've done nothing new, really. We've uh, just discovered Beer's Law. So you can read up on Beer's Law on the Wikipedia page if you wish. But Beer's Law is typically stated like this. So log, oh, this is natural log, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. But we just have this constant epsilon here in place of this constant here. Epsilon is called the moral, moral, ah, molar, moral. That should be molar absorptivity. Um, it's also known as the molar extinction coefficient, or extinction coefficient. This should equal the effective area times Avogadro's number. So let's, uh, you know, we've, we've derived this equation. One thing that you should probably always do when you derive an equation as an engineer is check the units. So we know on this side, this is intensity divided by intensity, and you take the logarithm of that, that should be unitless. Here we know that is area per molecule, effective area per molecule. Avogadro's number is molecules per mole. Uh, concentration is, we said it's molar, so it's moles per volume, meters cubed, and the width of the cuvette is just in length, we can do that in meters. Molecules uh, cancel out, moles cancel out, uh, meters squared times meters is meters cubed, meters cubed over meters cubed, all that cancels out, so unitless equals unitless, so we, we did good. Um, <coughs> Ah, let's take a look at uh, Beer's Law and see what the units on epsilon should be. So if epsilon equals this area times Avogadro's number, we can, uh, again, you know, put those units out, cross out molecules, we end up with meters squared per mole. Um, this is, if we multiply the top and the bottom just by meters, we can end up with our 1 over molarity over distance. So that will cancel out with our concentration times width. So that equals unitless too. So we are right. So just so you know, that epsilon can hold a conversion factor from the natural log to log base 10. Typically for liquids, Beer's law is in base 10. For gases, it's natural log. I wish it was all in natural log, but such is science. It is not. <coughs> so we've we've come up with our equation. We know I naught, we can get that. We know I, we know W. If we know molar absorptivity, we can get concentration. So let's do a little <coughs> example. Let's say that we have a spectrophotometer and we make a 1 times 10 to minus 5 molar calibration solution, malachite green in water. We know it's uh, one centimeter long. We put pure water in the cuvette. We end up with four volts in our detector. But with the calibration solution, we end up with two volts. With an opaque solution, so no light makes it through, we end up with zero volts. And we know the uh, the response is linear, linearly proportional to the light intensity. So effectively, our volts, our volt, you know, two volts divided by four volts is going to be our intensity uh, coming out divided by intensity sub zero. If we, uh, and now we want to know what is the extinction coefficient of malachite green. So let's do part A first. We uh, start with Beer's Law. 
we're doing it with base 10 here. So intensity is the ratio of intensity should be the ratio of voltage because they're linearly proportional to 2 volts over 4 volts. We know the concentration, we know the sample width. With that, we just need to rearrange a little bit and we can get our moral absorptivity. Molar, not moral. Um, <coughs> part B. So now we put an unknown sample of the same dye of crystal violet into the spectrophotometer. We know, we just calculated the uh, extinction coefficient. We read a voltage of that. What is the concentration of malachite green? So we don't know this. We know this, 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 and this. And now we need to find is the concentration there. Let's do a little rearranging and we get our concentration, which is pi times 10 to the minus 5 moles. So what is all... Okay, so how is this equation and all this information about light and samples and solutions and molecules absorbing light at different wavelengths going to be used? Let's take a look at a simulation that I've made. So here we've got our light, our cuvette, our detector, light of a certain wavelength. We can change the wavelength of light. We can change the intensity of the light. Uh, we can change the spectrum of the solution. It's just as random right now. Let's go to uh, crystal violet. So one of the first things we need to do is determine I not. So the intensity of light uh, without any crystal violet in there, so just through a clear cuvette. So we need to adjust the intensity of light we want. We want that to be 100%. I just happen to know that 50% power gives us 100% transmittance. Of course there's some noise because this is supposed to be simulating a real system. Um, so let's just say that we want to determine the molar extinction coefficient of crystal violet. We want to do that at its peak absorbance, so we need a little bit more of a dilute solution. That's maybe 2 dilute. Let's go up to 4. That looks good right there. So if we go here, power to 50. <clears throat> now we know how much light makes it through, which is not really enough right now, so let's go up a little bit more. Yeah, so you can see if we change the concentration, we change the amount transmitted. <clears throat> the other thing we can do, particularly with something like crystal violet, let's go back up to 5, is react it with sodium hydroxide. So here we have A plus B goes to C. It's a first order reaction. This is what we're going to actually do with your spectrophotometers that you make. We're going to do this in the lab. So I'm going to start this reaction. You can see the transmittance starts to go up. Absorbance goes down, and because we know the molar extinction coefficient, we can calculate the, ca the concentration. So it looks something like this, which again looks like an exponential decay. If we take the natural log, it ends up being a straight line, and we'll talk about why that is in class. And that concludes that.